So good evening, Dr. Silvestri. We are happy to have you today on our interview on the moral limits of the market. We enjoyed your sessions with us back a few months ago, and we decided to have this session with you and delve a little bit deeper with some questions and also get more knowledge from you. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. It's, it's a true pleasure to see you once more after the course. And it's maybe it's a sign that uh, I did a good course. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did. And we really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So I remember that back in class, you were talking about the fact that the typical market system is or the typical economy is more based on the state providing. And even when we look at the history of economics, we have we see that the state provides and people are more subsistent and the exchanges are due, uh, due to individual needs and it works that way. But now we are seeing something very different in the society right now. And we, are, we really want to know if you see the society being geared more towards making money at the expense of ethics and morale. And if you think that there are certain things that should not be for sale, what are your take? What is your take on that? Oh, thanks. This is a very good, uh, and I would also say very difficult question. I know we have been talking about this, but it's very difficult to summarize a very huge debate because, well, first of all, I think that at least in truth, uh, your question are two distinct but connected or related questions. They, of course, as you said, revolves around the problem of the moral limits of the market. And this is the, it's a very long debate. It has had some momentum over the last 30 years, and it has been, uh, so to say, revived. Uh, and it's still in the spotlight, thanks to, in part, some famous scholars, as they say, it's a pop star uh, of philosophy, Michael Sandel, for his book uh, that was published 10 years ago, What Money Can Buy, The Moral Limits of the Markets. Um, well, of course, this is also a debate that it's a little bit difficult to summarize, as I said, in a few minutes, but you also may wish to know that it's something that can be traced back even to Aristotle. Aristotle was okay. at least one of the very first thinkers who raised the question about ethics and economics. Um, now, uh, let's try to focus, I would say, since it is a very difficult debate, at least to try, I would like to try to simplify this debate, at least to, uh, with an operation of getting rid of some ambiguities and source of confusions, because I think it's at least important for the sake of public debate to clarify them. When we first think about the relationship between market and morals, uh, there are lots of source, sources of confusion. So uh, the first one is, if we raise the question, do markets um, corrupt morals? If the question is posed in these terms, I think it's too general because the, the three key concepts like markets, corruption and morals are too general. So we should at least try to clarify what we mean by them. Take, for example, corruption. Now, you know that the phenomenon of corruption has existed as long as man has existed, or if you prefer, since we fell from heaven, so we could say that it is inherent in man. So corruption is not something that can be said to be typical or specific of contemporary market societies, and let alone the market per se. On the other hand, there are many sources of corruption. Think about power. Power. Uh, as Lord Acton once said, power corrupts and absolute powers corrupt uh, absolutely. Now, another source of confusion in this type of debate is uh, the equivalence that sometimes is drawn between market and money, as if they were the same thing. Think about, again, the very famous uh, case of Judas Iscariotas, who betrayed Jesus. Now, uh, he betrayed Jesus for the famous 30 denarii. Right. Uh, but at the same time, is this an issue that is belonging or is pertaining to the market? It's money that, of course, corrupts, not necessarily a market as such. Um, and the last thing I would like to clarify before entering into this huge debate is the way in which we are used to uh, put market and morals in relation with each other. Sometimes people 
used to think market versus morals as if they were counterposed to each other, or in another way, as if they were entirely separated from each other. Let me give you some example. If you think about market versus moral, sometimes the implicit assumption is that uh, it's a kind of dichotomy fallacy. It's as if the market is bad and the moral is good, but this is not a good way of reasoning. It's uh, perhaps an ideological way of reasoning, but it's not a good way. The second case I mentioned is when market are thought as if it were a morally free zone, as if the market were amoral, amoral, where the A, uh, it's a kind of privative, as if the market has nothing to do with morality. But this is, again, uh, entirely wrong because market cannot function without morality. You have to have, for example, some at least some basic virtues like honesty, trustworthiness, reputation, and many other virtues for the market to work. Now, the question that you raise is, uh, of course, not about these big issues like corruption. It's more related, as you said at the beginning, uh, to the current debate about market and morality or market, the moral limits of the market. Right. Now, when scholars are used to think about this debate, they usually uh, are thinking about two distinct questions. The first one is usually, when is a voluntary or market exchange fair or unfair? And the second one has to do with the problem of corruption, degradation, and it is related to the second part of your question, are there goods or services that should not be for sale? So. As for the first question, uh, usually we need to distinguish uh, clearly two distinct types of ideal, moral ideals that are presupposed by the question. If we ask, as I said, when is a voluntary exchange fair? By fair, sometimes we mean whether we are asking whether that exchange uh, has been coerced, for example. Right. Now, if it has been coerced, the moral ideal at stake is freedom, autonomy, uh, and therefore you are taking care about a distinct aspect of a specific aspect of fairness. So you are referring in some respect to the ideal of consent that is should be carried out under fair background conditions. You think also about the so-called forced labor. Now, forced labor is of course a kind of coerced contract. You may think at least that might be coerced. Uh, but of course, people may also uh, disagree. Um, uh, usually, this kind of fairness issues cannot be settled uh, by a priori arguments alone, at least, uh, but may also depend on some empirical facts. For example, I may wonder whether if you are working for these monopolies, I may wonder whether you have thought about possible alternatives, if there, there are, in reality, possible alternatives or you may not be aware of such possible alternatives. And this is another empirical issue. So in some cases, the problem might be the coercion per se rather than the market per se. So instead of eliminating the market, you may want to eliminate the coercion of the exchange. And if it is a case of monopoly, you may wish to have more markets rather than less. Um, and, and this is of course, uh, this. Well, the second part of your question related to the, the, the moral uh, uh, ideal of the good at stake, the moral importance of the good or service at stake has to do with the problem of degradation, corruption, and so forth. So the moral ideal in this case is different from coercion or freedom or autonomy for the very simple reason. If you think the classic example of prostitution, we may wonder whether it's fair to exchange the body for money. Now, in this case, of course, if you resolve the problem of coercion, you may say, look, uh, I'm not starving, so I'm not prostituting myself for uh, reasons linked to uh, necessity or starving or whatever. So imagine that you are uh, living in a, in a very good society and you have a very high standard of living. And then, uh, you may not have the problem of coercion, but at the same time, you may have the second issue, that is whether you are degrading your body, you know, by prostituting. 
And so uh, this is also the reason why you have to keep them uh, separated. In this case, nevertheless, the debate is still a little bit, there is at least uh, some, sorts of, some sorts of confusion. Because as I said, the problem in this case, to think again about the question of prostitution, you may slightly reframe the question by asking, does, for example, doing sex for money corrupt or degrade the very nature of sex or body sold for money? Perhaps the most paradigmatic case is Titumus and his famous book, uh, The Gift of Relationship. He, in a sense, he launched this debate about the corruption or crowding out of intrinsic motivation. He was thinking about the gift of blood. So he was worried at that time, it was 1970, he was worried about uh, two economists that were proposing to introduce something that was the market for blood instead of giving the blood for free as a gratuitous gift. Now, uh, he raised this famous uh, uh, so-called now, it is called the corruption objection. He said, well, if we, instead, uh, instead of giving them the, the blood for free as a, an act of altruism or of benevolence or whatever, if we are paid to give our blood, then this, is, this very act is going to corrupt the motivation of giving the blood. Now, there has been a huge debate since, since the 70s, and I cannot uh, explore it, but it's important at least to remember that it, I think, at least I've also I've written something about this, uh, that it, I don't think that the introduction of the market necessarily corrupts the gift giving of blood. So if you want to, uh, if, uh, if I can give you an example, think about introducing a market for blood parallel to the gift giving of blood. Now, if you were giving your blood uh, for altruistic reasons, and you are a true altruist, I may think that uh, you have no reason to shift to the other market. Or you can do that, but at the same time, uh, it's not necessarily, uh, I think it's not a necessary consequence that you are giving the money for blood and then you are not altruistic any longer. So I think this is, again, another empirical issue that is to be perhaps uh, tested. But anyway, this is, again, a, a very tough question. Let me just conclude with one thing. Maybe uh, I've gone to, it's, uh, I know it's a short interview, but it will be shorter uh, in the second half of the interview. So uh, the last part of your question is uh, at the core of this debate. So are there goods or services that should not be for sale? Now, from a certain point of view, uh, of course, I mean, it's obvious that there are things that should not be for sale. So the obvious reply is yes, there are things that should not be for sale. Think of human rights. Now, by chance, human rights are also termed inalienable rights, not alienable rights, uh, non-negotiable rights. So you cannot sell them. Now, the most obvious example is slavery. This is an example that I take from another book uh, that came out quite recently by um, uh, Peter Yarowski and Jason Brennan, that is, uh, the, so to say, the counterpart of Michael Sandel's book. The title is Market Without Limits. So they are criticizing much of this uh, debate that stem from, well, it's, it comes uh, from the 90s, uh, one of the very first book about this debate is a book by Anderson, then the Brasset and many other scholars. But they are questioning much of the basic assumption. And they say, look at the slavery. Now, if I come to you and I say, uh, look, uh, you and Cynthia, uh, I, and I tell you, I want you to be my slave. And I'm going to pay you 1 million euros. So what's wrong about this? Imagine that you sign this kind of contract and therefore you, you, you are going to, to, to be my slave. So what is wrong with this kind of economic exchange? Is the economic exchange as such or is the slavery that is wrong? Of course, you should think about the slavery as a problem of human dignity. Well, at least today we are likely enough, uh, we have get rid of these terrible, terrible uh, institutions. So we know we give for granted that it is a terrible institution. But the bed of the slavery is not, has nothing to do with exchange, the monetary or market exchange. It has to do with the problem of slavery as such. So it's an issue of human beings. It's an issue of human dignity and autonomy and freedom. So you should not sign the contract, not because I'm paying you, but simply because you should uh, 
not want to become a slave. Right. So this is the problem. Or another example might be imagine that I am a magnanimous slave master and I come to you and I want to give you a couple of my uh, slaves. This is a gift, I can say. So I'm not asking you any money. So I'm not doing an economic exchange once more. But what's wrong with that? Again, even if there is no exchange, the problem is that the slavery as such. So this should, in a sense, at least clarify why there is lots of confusion when we think about the role of the market and exchange when whether they corrupt. Okay. So considering that, what do you think would happen in the market if there were no limits at all? And um, do you think that it would lead to uh, the commodification of everything? Do you think that it would, what do you think would happen? This is another good question. Um, I think that it depends on what we mean by limits. If by limits, we mean rules, mm -hmm. then we need to be more, uh, Precise, you say. For example, we sometimes uh, hear expressions like uh, unregulated market, that's market without rules, as if the market is something like the jungle. Now, I do not believe that there are and have ever been markets without rules, formal or legal rules, or even just informal rules. Imagine the handshake with which you can you can seal the deal between the contracting parties. That is a rule, an informal rule, of course, but it's still a rule. And the market cannot function without such rules. So we know very well that any markets, especially uh, the markets in contemporary society, cannot work well without at least the protection of private property and contracts. So it is impossible to have a market. And again, the metaphor of the market uh, as a jungle is a very powerful metaphor, at least rhetorically, and it is often used ideologically, simply to denigrate uh, the market. But this type of ideological use of such metaphors serves only uh, to cloud ideas rather than clarify them. And I think it doesn't do a good service to the public discussion. Uh, it comes to my mind this very famous article by the then first elected president of the Italian Republic, Luigi Naudi. He wrote this article with the title Il Fantoccio Liberistico in, in Italian. That is a little bit untranslatable, but it means that people are using the word, the name, the label liberismo as a kind of straw man. And this is happening today with the term neoliberalism. Most of the time, that is another source of great confusion, at least in public and scholarly debates. So in conclusion, if we were to uh, take the meaning of your question literally, although of course this is not your intention or what you wanted to convey, I would say if there are no limits to the market, then there is no market. To put it in another way, I would avoid um, the expression no limits, as I think it might be better to distinguish between good and bad rules, whether the criterion of distinction might be between, let's say, rules that protect the common good and rules that serve only the private good of or the interest of a few. Thank you very much for this answer. But when you mentioned the interest of the few, it brought to mind that if we are going to characterize the market then by you know everybody pursuing their interest, everybody pursuing their advantage, then what exactly will determine the limits of the individual? I know we are trying to avoid this word limits, but what would determine the limits of the individual? No, no, no. I mean, I, I see that uh, you insist on the concept of limit and I can also understand the reason because this is a huge anthropological issue. Right. You're right to insist on the issue of the limits. Um, I will try to say something about this, but the, much of the anthropological issues uh, related to the notion of limits uh, should be left a little bit in the background. So in your question, in this case, there are two key uh, concepts. Okay. The first one well, it's limit, as we said, or who sets the limits or what determines the limits of the individuals. And the second one is 
pursuing one's personal advantage. Okay. Let's start from the second one. When we think about the idea of pursuing personal advantage, uh, we should ask whether there is something morally wrong with pursuing one's personal advantage. Well, in principle, I would say the answer is no. There is nothing particularly wrong in pursuing the personal advantage. Okay. It comes to my mind this very famous, often quoted passage of Adam Smith, uh, when he said, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker, that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest or interest. And he also added that we do not address, or we address ourselves, not to their humanity or benevolence, or, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our necessity or our needs, but we talk to them about their advantage. I think this is an important passage. We talk to them about their advantage. Now, first, uh, there has been lots of interpretations uh, re related to this famous quote. The first one is perhaps uh, the wrong one. That is, it's well, among scholars is known as the famous Adam Smith problem as if Adam Smith were writing two separate books, The Theory of Moral Sentiment and The Wealth of Nation, and as if these two books were entirely separated or even counterposed to each other. So think, Smith uh, thinking about morals and morality in one way in the theory of moral sentiment, as if the idea of sympathy is a good thing, and Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nation talking about self-interest as if the self-interest were a good thing. Now, this idea of the Adam Smith problem, this separation of Adam Smith in two Adam Smiths is completely wrong. This is something that we know, uh, we have been knowing, so to say, for uh, quite a long time. But the key, as I said, may be the last part of the statement when he mentioned the fact that we have to talk about their advantage. So even if we want, if we want to have dinner tonight, we have to talk about their advantage. So another possible interpretation might be um, that first, the market doesn't necessarily uh, reward and encourage greed. Smith never said something like that. Okay. Uh, and this is more related to the so-called Adam Smith problem. Uh, and the most important part, in my view, of this uh, quote is that uh, the exchange, any exchange, is a kind of, uh, let's say, two-way street. Right. So we should properly speak of mutual advantage, not necessarily self-advantage, or an advantage that is pursued only for uh, ourselves. And this is the reality, because any economic exchange implies the fact that the two parties have at least to gain something, gains from trade. Um, so, but does this mean that benevolence is not important? Uh, well, not at all. Again, Adam Smith said that justice is the pillar of the social edifice, and benevolence is the ornament. So society can stand even if people are not benevolent. This is not perhaps a good society. It's a society that can survive just by self-interest, but this is a huge discovery after uh, Thomas Hobbes after, I mean, this is a, the greatest, perhaps, paradigmatic shift in social sciences, the discovery that society can sustain, can live, even without benevolence. But I repeat, this is not necessarily a good society, of course. So the second part of your question, that is, uh, what sets the, the limits to individuals? My simple answer is the law and justice, to, re to remind Adam Smith. Of course, this is an issue that cannot simply be uh, treated by calling into question market and morals. We need law. We need law to set this kind of limits. And this is the typical purpose of law. Even just to our meal once, when he was thinking about the famous, by now famous, so-called harm principle. It simply states that the action of individuals should only be limited to prevent harm to others individuals. Okay. But this again is a question that has to be resolved by law and cannot be posed all in terms of uh, market versus moral.
But let's imagine that uh, let's imagine a situation where the um, the state would would have the control over all the markets on everything. What do you think could happen? What constraints can the state and the people face? And um, do you think is that even possible in France, for example? <laughs> uh, this is a very excellent question for many reasons. In Uh, first, uh, this is not necessarily a utopian uh, scenario because it's something that really happened. In fact, for example, we have known totalitarian regimes such as communism, where the market and primarily private property were entirely in the hands of, of the state. So the, the market were entirely absorbed by the state. So from the side of, uh, let's say, the state, there were no particular constraints since it was free to do whatever it wanted to do, more or less, I would say. While for, from the point of view of the people or the individuals uh, or subject to these totalitarian regimes, they faced uh, terrible constraints. And constraints here may even sound a little bit uh, uh, an euphemism because people were suffering from starvation, Uh, abuse of power, arb arbitrary power, and violence, um, and violation of every fundamental rights, arbitrary imprisonment, suppression of freedom of speech and press, and the list goes on um, and on. So to paraphrase a famous uh, statement by Hayek, I would say that whoever controls the means controls also all our ends. So if the state controls economic means, the market, the private property, then the state can control all our ends. So it may decide what we should do. So it's capturing our freedom. Um, also, it is a question, it, I, I said that it's a good question for, for many reasons, but one of these reasons has to do uh, with the fact that it brings us back Uh, at the beginning of the debate uh, on the moral limits of market, uh, but in a very interesting way, I would say. Uh, at least it allows me to talk about things that I haven't had the time to, to mention. So much of the debate about uh, markets and morals or the moral limits of the market takes for granted a very problematic dichotomy that is market versus non-market. But it is not clear what should we mean by non-market, the other side of this dichotomy. If, for example, uh, by non-market, we mean non-market uh, societies, uh, then we need to get clear on what this kind, of, this kind of societies are. And, for example, we may wonder whether we are talking about uh, current society, alternative current society, ancient society or utopian, again, utopian society. And the reason why we need a kind of benchmark is that in order to see whether market, for example, corrupts morality, you need to know something that is not corruption. You need to have a kind of benchmark. You need to have uh, a normative criterion through which, thanks to which you can judge whether the, counter, the current reality has been corrupted. So we are moving towards something that is bad, for example. You need to have something at least in mind, something that is good to judge whether this is bad. Uh, so for example, the thesis that the market society, um, as they say, crowds out certain virtues such as altruism, solidarity, benevolence, mutual trust, or other civic virtues should imply that in today's market societies, These virtues should be completely absent since the market, as they say, or according to this kind of thesis, market has colonized every aspect of life. But is this really the case? As I mean, the market crowd out all these kind of virtues. We don't see them any, any longer. Now, there has been a, an interesting debate on this between Michael Sandel, as far as I remember, it's, it was on the Boston Review. Uh, between Michael Sandel and other scholars, among them two famous economists, uh, Bowles and Gintis. Um, and they've shown uh, 
together with other scholars, uh, it's a famous study together with anthropologists and many other scholars, that several studies show uh, how core values such as religious tolerance, gender equality, democracy, fairness and reciprocity have flourished precisely in market societies. So the notion that the market economy makes people greedy, selfish, and amoral is simply fallacious according to this kind of experiments, this kind of uh, empirical testing. And this is, is, has also been uh, confirmed by two other scholars. It comes to my mind, another interesting book in this regard by Virgil Storr uh, Stor, and Ginny Choi. The title is Do Market Corrupt Our Morals? So they made lots of um, empirical um, testing using a huge empirical data set to show that current society or current market society performs better than other types of society like some other uh, countries or um, not uh, well at least comparing for example the usa with north korea or other uh, society so the, to come back to your question whether the market corrupts uh, or crowd outs morals maybe we should reframe the question in another way so the right question might be or should be does the market corrupt morals but compare to what this is also the reason why i was saying we need a benchmark so what what, what exactly are we comparing when we think about the market so we need to have a non-market once more well we need to know whether this is a kind of society already existing or a utopian society that we are using as a sort of a benchmark. So to conclude, we may make a sort of variation on your last question, but maybe it's a variation on all these questions. Uh, you were referring to the case of the state controlling the market, right? Uh, calling into question another famous dichotomy that is state versus market together with the market versus non-market. Now, but we could also ask, uh, we could also, let's say, have a reverse situation when economic power controls the state or a more hybrid um, realistic situation or strong of strong collusion between economic power and political power. And this is already a way out uh, of the sharp opposi opposition between market and non-market or market versus state. And from this perspective, it seems to me that uh, the great absentee in the moral limits of market debates is precisely the perverse entanglement between state and market, sometimes named crony capitalism. But this should be perhaps the subject of another discussion. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Professor Tsovetsky. Yeah, it's really, been a pleasure really to discuss with you and to see you once more after some months. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, good luck for your master. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One thing that we have basically learned is that the market in itself isn't that corrupt as we think. And that's something that we are going to keep with us. That's there's also power, there's corruption, there's so much more going on outside of the market, and the market isn't in itself. A corrupt entity. Thank you so much once again, Professor Silvestri, Thank for you. your time with us and your patience. Yeah. We're glad to have you. Thank you for opening our mind and exactly. Well, it's, a, it's been a pleasure. I like talking about this topic, and above all, it's been a pleasure to see you once more. And I really Thank wish you good luck for your future and the master thesis. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.